Okay, hi everyone. I'm David. I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm doing a PhD in string theory at the, the University of British Columbia. <clears throat> um, and I'm going to tell you today about my journey, so how I, how I got here, and a little bit about what being a theoretical physicist is actually like, so a day in the life. So my journey begins on the other side of the world in a country called Australia, and in a city called Melbourne in the southeast. So this is a city uh, slightly bigger than Vancouver, uh, famous for, among other things, it's alleys and street art and coffee, uh, both of which I miss. So this is the city that, that I grew up. So here is a, a younger, angrier version of David. Um, angry for a bunch of different reasons, but in high school, probably the biggest reason was that I was having a lot of uh, issues at home, so particularly issues with my dad. And my way of dealing with a lot of this was basically to hang out with my friends. And hanging out with my friends entailed a couple of different things, but um, probably the main activity was skating. So we would wag school, hit up the local mall, and you know find things to jump on top of and roll around on. <clears throat> but um, you know other shenanigans included uh, a lot of drinking on the weekends um, and various I don't know fights and pranks and stuff like that. So it's not all bad, but it certainly was not a recipe for academic success. So I was doing pretty badly in a lot of my subjects, and I'm actually lucky that I, I didn't get kept down. So I feel like there's kind of a feedback loop here. Uh, skating, wagging school, binge drinking on the weekends, not a recipe for academic success, and doing badly at school meant that I didn't really want to be there. You know, I wanted to kind of spend more time with my friends, skating and drinking and so forth. And I predict that if things had gone the way that they were going, I probably would have dropped out. <clears throat> but in grade 10, something kind of miraculous happened. So I was hanging around in the school library, I had a free period, I guess, and just like browsing random books, and I saw something which caught my eye. So it was this book here, it's called Archimedes Revenge by Paul Hoffman, and the cover was just pretty off the wall. It was uh, a giant egg being guarded by Mounties. I had no idea what was going on, but it was sufficiently kind of weird and intriguing that I had to open it up and, and look inside. And this changed my life. So this is a, a pop science book about maths, or maybe a pop math book, I don't know. And it covered all sorts of stuff from uh, encryption and the Beale cipher, which is like a famous unbroken cipher, to topology and geometry. So topology is like rubber sheet geometry, um, networks and graph theory, uh, the limits of computation, so what you can and can't do with computers, or what's going to take you a really long time with a computer. Uh, paradoxes of voting, um, prime numbers, uh, all sorts of other things that I'd never seen before and that totally blew my mind. Um, and I loved it. There were no equations, or very few equations, um, but the ideas seemed really cool. And so I began to kind of scour the library for things which seemed cool like this. And soon, <clears throat> I happened upon a book called How to Build a Time Machine by Paul Davies. So this is not a book about maths, this is a book about physics, and in particular the physics of time travel. So the, the main thing is the, the wacky world of relativity and black holes and wormholes, and this also seemed magical to me, even more magical, in fact, than the strange egg on the front cover of Archimedes' Revenge and Unbroken Ciphers and all of that. So, these books made me realize that science was magic. You know, and scientists were magicians. They could wave their wand and say some magic words like encryption or write down some arcane formula. So this is Fermat's last theorem. Uh, or just draw a picture. And here we have a, a wormhole. And achieve miraculous things. So, you know, you could uh, you know, send a secret message. Um, in, in some cases, an unbreakably secret message. Uh, you know, Fermat famously claimed that he could prove this theorem in the margins of a, a book. Um, he said that the, the proof was too big to fit in the margins, and people are now kind of skeptical about whether he had a proof at all, but, you know, I don't know, maybe he did. Um, and if you could build a wormhole, then you could travel through time. You could have shortcuts between distant parts of the galaxy. So all of this basically seems like magic to me, because sometimes the, the reasoning behind it is actually pretty simple. And the, the king of simple, uh, simple reasoning and magic, in my eyes, was Einstein. So as far as I'm concerned, Einstein 
may as well have been able to shoot lasers from his eyes. Uh, his intuitions were so simple and the maths was often so simple I and mean, particularly for special relativity. Um, there, were, there were a few things there that, that I could sort of understand when I was in grade 10. So he was the, he was the king of the magicians. Um, but when I tried to kind of like learn more maths and physics, I ran into a problem. My maths was really not very good. So I remember in grade 10, struggling with the following question. What is minus one times minus one? And I spent a while at, you know, trying to figure out whether it was minus one or one. Those seemed to be the only two reasonable options, but I couldn't quite tell why it would be one, which is what the textbook said it was, and not minus one, which also seemed like kind of a reasonable guess. So I thought about it for a while, and eventually I kind of came to the, the sort of following realization. I could think of minus one and multiplying by minus one is sort of like rotating the number line by 180 degrees. So if you multiplied one by minus one, that would take you to kind of like minus one, which is kind of the flipped version on the other side of the number line. And if I did that again, then I would get back to one. So that was my kind of way of understanding why minus one times minus one is equal to one. And first of all, I felt like very weak because I couldn't just remember what this kind of rule for multiplying negative numbers was. I had to come up with some kind of crazy picture for it. And even then, my picture didn't really make sense. I was like, well, if you rotate, then maybe if you kind of do a half rotation, you know, what is that? It didn't really make sense to me. So I, I, I sort of, you know, even though I kind of now knew how to multiply negative numbers, I sort of, I felt even stupider than before. Um, of course, it is actually interesting to do one of these half rotations, these rotations by 90 degrees that takes you out of real numbers and into imaginary numbers, um, or complex numbers in general. I didn't know that at the time, but asking crazy, asking crazy questions like this is not always a bad idea. But um, the fact remains that my maths results were not good. So at the end of grade 12, uh, my favorite subject was physics. I loved it uh, and I did pretty well at it, um, but my maths was not so good. And when I was considering, you know, what career to, to choose, uh, it seemed like physics was a bad idea because I would need to be good at maths. And that seemed like a really high bar, okay, particularly because I, I felt like I was very weak at maths. So <clears throat> there was an alternative though, because my results were good. I could also look at a couple of other courses uh, and people advised me to look at law. And I was kind of neutral about law. I didn't know anything about it, but there were a few arguments in favor of law. Uh, one was money. I could graduate and actually kind of earn a decent wage. And, you know, there was some a clear vocation at the other end. And the other was, you know, prestige. You know, it was kind of like a, an exciting uh, professional course. Uh, you know, being a law student sounded like a cool thing. It was competitive, uh, and so on. And that actually meant that there was quite a bit of pressure on me um, from various parties to, to take this up. And because of that pressure and because of the high bar that Matt set that I was pretty confident that I couldn't get over, I ended up going with law. And so began a long and extremely non-linear period of exploring different things. So I studied law for a year and a half before realizing that law was entirely a system of arbitrary rules and I didn't really like arbitrary rules. I could never memorize them. So that was kind of it for me. But I was doing humanities at the same time. So I was taking some philosophy and literature subjects and I really loved reading books. I loved literature. So I thought, hey, maybe I'll you know, read books and analyze them. That could be a problem. So I focused on literature for a while. But I realized that, you know, I enjoyed reading books for pleasure and sometimes analyzing them takes the magic away. So instead I, I decided to focus on the other thing that I was studying, which was philosophy. And philosophy was great. There were no arbitrary rules in philosophy. It was like the opposite of law. You know, everything was up for grabs. And as part of my like, philosophical training, I was exposed to logic. So logic is, if you like, it's like a bedrock of mathematics. It's, it's the stuff that everything else is built from. And very slowly, very cautiously, I began to explore mathematics. And I realized that I actually really liked maths. Uh, and I decided, uh, although it was a hard decision, I decided to go back into a second degree uh, in mathematics. So I ended up studying pure and applied maths. And maths was great. So I realized that what I thought were weaknesses when I was in high school, so the fact that I kind of needed to understand things myself in like weird ways and draw pictures and ask crazy questions, all of those were actually strengths. Um, they're not strengths for high school maths, unfortunately, but they were strengths for studying maths in a tertiary setting. And at the end of my degree, 
I was uh, very enthusiastic about the idea of going on to a career in maths. And I maybe made the foolish decision of sitting in on a couple of advanced physics classes that were relevant to some of the mathematical things I was interested in. And I realized that I was in the wrong course. Really what I wanted to do, the thing that I should have been doing all along, was physics. So I switched from maths to physics, but now I had the mathematical background that I needed in order to understand the, the physics that I wanted to understand. So even though I kind of moved away from the thing that I really loved when I was in high school and took a complex uh, path, pun intended, I ended up back there in the end. Okay, so that brings me to the present day and what I do now. So just briefly, uh, <clears throat> I got a master's degree uh, in Melbourne in an area called particle physics. So this is the area of physics being studied at the, the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. So where we smash things together at very high energies and see what comes out. And I enjoyed this, but I decided that I wanted to study things that were even smaller and harder to access. So I moved to Canada to study string theory and quantum gravity. So quantum gravity is what you get when you kind of try to smoosh together gravity, which is kind of the theory governing the universe at really large scales and quantum mechanics, which is governing the universe at very small scales. And the place where these two things collide uh, is the black hole. So one of the things that I'm most interested in is understanding what happens to things that fall into a black hole. So here's a picture of a black hole as a computer. And there's some kind of input for the computer. You can think of this as stuff that you've thrown into the black hole, like a, you know, a stray astronaut like Matthew McConaughey and Stella. Um, and the question is, is there output? Does the stuff that fall into the black hole come out again? Okay, so that's, that's an open question. And Stephen Hawking uh, made a really uh, very persuasive, famous argument 40 years ago that the stuff that falls in does not come out again. But one of the most exciting developments in the last uh, year or two in my field has been fairly conclusive evidence that stuff does come out again. And there are kind of ongoing efforts to understand precisely you know, how if something falls in, you can kind of reconstruct. So if you drop your homework into the black hole, it sucks, but is, is it lost forever? Or can you actually kind of uh, get the answer to that hard maths problem again? Okay, so that's like super briefly like what I do. Um, or what I study, but what does it actually look like to study this? So a typical day starts with me waking up, rolling out of bed and drinking uh, enough coffee until I feel human and able to think about things. So usually I have a question or maybe 10 questions that I'm interested in, in trying to under understand or figure out. And in order to go about answering them, I will go read books. So pictures, my bookshelf here. Uh, or I will read papers, um, I'll do calculations, and sometimes I'll draw pictures. In fact, very often I'll draw pictures instead of doing calculations, and then I need to do calculations in order to understand the pictures, and vice versa. But really I can summarize all of this by saying that I'm confused most of the time. I don't really know what I'm doing. And in fact, I would say that maybe like, I don't know, 85 or 90% of the time I'm confused. And then there are brief, lucid periods of unconfusion where I write papers. So those papers summarize the results of, of my confusion and what I did in order to kind of become unconfused. But I don't want to say that being confused is a bad thing. It's actually a profitable thing. It means that you're in the right place. It means that there are interesting questions that you're asking and that there's something to kind of discover at the end of the day. Um, I think that's cool. And I think curiosity is something that can kind of only, only arise when you're confused about things. Because if you know the answer, then you know, what is there to be curious about? And this is really what I think the essence of being a theoretical physicist is. It's enjoying the state of being confused and spending a lot of time trying to use the magic of science and maths to become unconfused and then summarizing it for other people, which is something I really love as well. Obviously, I like drawing pictures uh, and this is kind of a fun thing you can do when you're trying to kind of summarize your unconfusion. Um, and that's pretty much it for my kind of summary of being a theoretical physicist. So my advice, kind of broadly speaking, is follow your passion. Okay, this is what I didn't do when I was in high school. And I had kind of, I think, a low opinion of myself. Um, and I think that things are typically easier than you expect. Even the things that look really hard and exotic and weird, they're, they're often easier um, when you apply your passion to them. 
Um, be curious. Uh, you don't always need to know the answer. It's very tempting to kind of always be the person who knows the answer, but it's actually much more fun to not know the answer. And then you get the pleasure of finding things out, as Richard Feynman said. Um, and finally, just embrace the confusion. You know, it's profitable, it's interesting, it will take you to interesting places. Uh, and yeah, theoretical physics, if you like confusion, theoretical physics is a great place to end up. Um, thanks for listening. <laughs>